From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Thursday, May 26. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Broadcom's record tech deal. The chipmaker offers $61 billion for VMware, 44% premium, plus a go-shop period in a monster tech deal. And you got Marvelous Macy's versus negative NVIDIA. The retailer bucks the trend, raises its profit forecast, while NVIDIA delivers a bleak outlook. We break down the bottom line on earnings. And the UK's windfall tax. Energy firms face a 25% tax on profits they don't invest to help people pay their energy bills. Power generators now could be next. We're going to speak to Nigel Wilson, CEO of Legal and General. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Guy, I feel like we're learning nuances in the economy. There are some strong spots. Some areas have pricing power. Retail and consumer can still be strong, whereas housing, inflation, those are the darker spots. Absolutely. People are having to pay their staff more. That is hurting uh, the middle of the P&L. That's hurting margins. But Macy's is a really interesting one today. We'll get on and talk about this in just a moment. But Macy's, as far as I can tell, is the going out trade. Yes, That's what's I happening agree. here. People are going out. It's reopening. We're still in the reopening part. Exactly. So how long does this last? And, and is that message actually incredibly rear-view mirror? This summer's going to be great. You look, at what, you look at what Southwest had to say today, you look at what JetBlue had to say today. It is going to be an amazing summer out there. People are going to be partying, they're going to be getting on aeroplanes. It's going to be fantastic. Not sure what happens after that. Yeah, I don't know if you guys talking about us, but I'm thinking no. But yeah, uh, not, we'll not do you some and things. Me. Not you and me, but <laughs> other people. Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to have a good summer, but other people are going to be doing these things. They're going to be buying great outfits, they're going to be partying, they're going to be getting on planes. Um, let's talk about the data. Uh, I like to start on a, on a bright note today. Um, pending home sales month on month, a little worse than anticipated. Negative 3.9%. That's the month on month number. The last number uh, was negative 1.2, so we're accelerating a little bit there. Uh, home sales on a non-seasonally adjusted year-on-year -year basis down 11.5%. So negative data from the housing market, to Alex's point, which I think is, is definitely worth making. Um, you've also got, obviously, a firm focus on what is happening with mortgage numbers right now. We'll continue uh, to focus on what is happening there. We should have a headline. Let me just see if I can get you that headline. Um, we'll come back to that in just a moment. I haven't quite got the headline yet. Um, let's talk about the earnings story, though. I want to focus on what is happening here. It's been a really mixed picture. So number of retailers out today with earnings. Macy's. Good. Dollar General, looking pretty good. Costco after the bell. Looking forward to seeing what Costco has to say. So this brings us basically to our question of the day. What is the bottom line for earnings? What are we learning here? Let's ask uh, Bloomberg's European market editor, Christina Guino, who is in New York for three months. So I'm not sure the European tag really applies, but we'll let that one go for the moment. And Ed Ludlow, out in the West Coast, Bloomberg's technology correspondent. Um, Ed, I'm going to start with you. So I've got, I've got a yeah. bunch of headlines on my screen. The first one is NVIDIA plunges. Uh, lockdowns yeah. are horrible. Everything is grim. Nothing's good. I've then got another headline crossing uh, on my blue book screen right now. NVIDIA hits session highs. <laughs> right. Is NVIDIA good news or bad news? Yeah. I'm going to answer the question of the day by saying, you know, till last night, investors had no tolerance for disappointment. You know, they wanted to see the bullish outlook. We learned that lesson from Netflix, which was the opposite. We learned that lesson from Snap when they revised their guidance in NVIDIA. The thing is that NVIDIA, the numbers in the quarter gone were very strong. You know, the demand is there. They're talking about the chip demand being maintained uh, at a time where other headwinds uh, are really focused on the supply side, right? They talked about $500 million of lost revenue in the quarter, accounts coming from China lockdowns, from the situation in Ukraine. But giving a signal of demand seems to be boosting this market. I would say we're now flat on the stock. Uh, it's bouncing over everything. I came here very prepared, and NVIDIA has really just <laughs> thrown that out the window. <laughs> yeah, markets do that. Um, Christine, uh, so... Let's talk about then of what Guy and I were mentioning at the top, which is, you know, the bottom line for earnings. What are we really seeing is are we seeing a reopening trade continuing? So like the stay at home stocks, they get hit. They need a super solid outlook. Um, the reopening trades, they have more leeway. 
Absolutely, Alex. And I think, you know, this is a story that will keep unfolding as we emerge from that pandemic era to the post pandemic era. Right. And, and I can personally attest to what Guy was saying, especially being a visitor here to New York. You know, people are going out. They're going out to shops to buy more stuff and buy more clothes and preparing for their summer <laughs> holidays. And you definitely get that feeling that the city is back. I think very similar to the way that London was just a few months ago. I mean, we do know that the UK and Europe in general, a, a few months ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to reopening and all that uh, from the U.S. And so we're really just now seeing this activity pick up in the U.S. And just in time for that very crucial summer holiday where a lot of retailers and a lot of travel related companies very much leaning on that season to kind of revive demand. So it's going to be very interesting. You know, I think the question that Guy is asking is very much relevant. How much of this, the activity pickup that we're seeing now, is going to be enough to sustain the um, uh, all of these kind of consumer geared companies yep. moving forward. I, I think we should we should stop the show now and figure out a where Christine's going out and b where she's shopping. But maybe we'll have to park that for another day. Probably blooming. Christine. <laughs> well, it is Macy's. next door. So <laughs> that's that's a pretty good. Pretty good starting point, isn't it? Um, Christine, let's just talk about the state of the consumer, because I think this is what we're trying to figure out. And that by extension takes us to the labor market as well. What I've heard this week from Davos has been a bunch of banking CEOs telling me that the consumer's in good shape, bank balances are in good shape. I'm also looking at a labor market that is in good shape. The debate at the moment is about whether or not we're going to get a recession. With the consumer in such good shape, with the labor market in such good shape, are we going to get a recession? And how does that recession start to develop if we are going to get it? Does it come from the consumer this time or does it come from somewhere else? Does it come from corporate profitability? Uh, that's a really interesting question, Guy. I mean, uh, as you're saying, you know, the consumer is showing uh, signs of strength. But I do, of course, wonder how behind the curve they are in terms of kind of uh, really experiencing the inflationary pressures that are coming through. Again, you know, we have seen a little bit of tightening in financial conditions in the economy. That's for sure. But perhaps there's a bit of a delay in that actually flowing through. I think also something to keep in mind is the fact that we really haven't seen yet the full brunt of the Fed's quantitative tightening process, right? Yes, right. we have seen those rate hikes coming through, but we haven't seen the, the balance sheet runoff process really starting. That's about to come through in June. And so the question for me is, if we have that secondary and potentially um, also very important lever, policy lever from the Fed coming through simultaneously with rate hikes, is that really going to um, create a much bigger impact for, for the consumer? But, you know, also how quickly is that going to um, uh, remedy the inflationary pressures that we are seeing in the economy right now? I think a lot of these questions still very much unanswered. And uh, for sure, the consumer uh, sentiment is going to be tested this summer. Again, that demand and that pickup in activity coming up against this wall of uh, right. just the Fed pulling back support. It's going to be very interesting. And I think we'll have more answers uh, a couple of months into the summer for sure. Right. And as we think about the consumer, I just want to think quickly about Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, because if there's commonality between corporate America, corporate Europe, mm -hmm. what you see creeping into the boilerplate at the beginning of earnings season to what's in the lead paragraph of the earnings statement, it's that the war in Ukraine has impacted demand, consumer sentiment on the continent, particularly in that kind of core and Eastern Europe, but here in the US as well. And companies have been very quick to say, we're worried about this, not just because of its effect on inflation yep. globally, but because of the demand side as well. Is it the demand side, though, Ed? I, I'm, I'm thinking about the kind of companies you cover. Apple paying right. people more. Right. Middle of the middle of the P&L again being hit. This is a margin story. We talk about a recession, but is it going to be a profits recession? Well, I'm just thinking I, 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 this I, feels very corporate at the moment. I woke up to a very worrying story, a big Bloomberg scoop. According to sources, Apple telling its suppliers to build 220 million handsets, the market looking for 240. That's the story you don't want to wake up to on the mm -hmm. Bloomberg because it tells you that they're worried about demand, but they're also worried about supply, right? There's money. There's an element of money left on the table because you're not able to make sales because of supply chain disruption, but you're also hearing that in that tone to suppliers, 
they're not hugely confident that yeah. growth will be robust this year. Right, because we already bought all our phones during lockdowns and now we're going out and buying wedding dresses. So like, exactly. I feel like it's all part of that uh, shifting demand story. Guys, thanks a lot. Really good uh, conversation. Bloomberg's Christina Kino and Ed Ludlow. Thank you both very much. Uh, well, coming up, Delta just said it's reducing service by about 100 daily flights from July 1st to August 7th. Now, our next guest is actually betting on travel and leisure. Alicia Levine, BNY Mel Wealth Management Head of Equities, will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. It is still quite a challenging environment and I think we've probably got another two quarters at least of, of volatility as we see the sort of economic backdrop gradually um, ease a little bit and then we'll be looking towards the fourth quarter maybe to see a little more clarity. That was Fidelity International CEO and Richards from Davos. And our question of the day now, what's the bottom line for earnings? Want to get more on this with Alicia Levine, BNY Mellon Wealth Management, Head of Equities and Capital Markets Advisory. Um, Alicia, what is it? Answer the question. What do you think? So, so we think earnings probably have to come down from here because we think the margins are really unsustainably high. They're record high margins, 13.4% in the fourth quarter staying pretty high this quarter and you could just see where the commentary is going on supply chain and, and the impact of inflation. So margins are going to come down and what the market's really been grappling with the last couple of weeks is the E on the PE, the earnings component. And it's likely that earnings have to soften from here. So I don't think that 253 for next year is really realistic when you think about where the real economy is going and some of the data we've seen. Where does that leave the market? So the market is, let's talk about multiple for a second. So the multiple has rapidly compressed from about 21.5 times to 16.5 times in a mere four and a half months, which is why this has felt so terrible. But it has done so with earnings staying steady and even moving up as a result of the Q1 earnings season. So we've done it all on multiples. If that's the case, then you can find a bottom here. The question is, if earnings are moving lower because the real economy is slowing, and let's face it, you don't have to call it a recession. A slowdown is enough to bring earnings lower. That's what the market's going to trade on. If learnings are, earnings are going to move lower, then the market's going to find another foot lower from here before it can really stabilize. So, and, the, the, so to that point, Alicia, the narrative then that we're still in a reopening trade so I hear you on the multiples. I hear you on the earnings and the margin pressure has to come down. But Macy's didn't have any margin pressure. Their margins were better. Dollar Tree, dollar store, same thing. I mean, are we just actually in the middle of a rotation still and a reopening? So we're still in that rotation from goods to services. You can't get around the fact that inventories are building on the good side as sales are coming down. And you really saw it in the big box retailers, which is why you had that huge reaction to Walmart and target earnings simply because those are the, the stores that, that feed and clothe and sell to America a little bit to the low end. So they're definitely feeling it there. The services component is still very strong. So the companies that service, whether it's vacations or travel or leisure, those will be really strong. This, they've gotten hit in this market because of the fear of the recession, but we actually think the share yep. of wallet will, will be going to those services. That trade is still there, and it's been there for six months. What happens in the next six months, though? I, I spend a lot of time talking to airline CEOs. They are super optimistic about this summer. They can see what's coming. Everybody wants to travel. Everybody wants to party. We're good to go. The problem then comes as we go into the winter... They have no visibility. They're quite nervous. They think this is going to be a flash in the pan, this reopening trade that is still unfolding and is going to unfold this summer. The market is a discounting mechanism, Alicia. That's right. When do we start discounting a more difficult, a difficult winter? Look, I think that is actually the best question out there because just as that stay-at-home trade and the pandemic winners turned out to be something of a parabola on demand, 
you may see it on the reopening side as well. And the market will price it in beforehand. And, and so you're going, the, the, the key about this recovery in the last two years is that there has been a massive mismatch between supply mm -hmm. and demands all over the place, including probably in travel. So that should moderate as we go forward. And then the real question mark is what happens the second half of the year to the real economy led by housing, which looks like it could start being in a slowdown. Not clear yet. But, you know, if you start seeing yep. housing numbers and home builder sentiment move lower, then that's going to tell you that the real economy, that's, that, that's the tip of the spear mm -hmm. on, on lower economic activity for the real economy. But did the chances of a soft landing just increase with the Fed minutes yesterday? And if we are able to execute, if the Fed executes a soft landing, does that narrative get extended? So it's really fascinating you're talking about that because the bond volatility has really declined in the last few weeks. And as you know, the two-year yield has come down because the market's starting to price in with a slowdown in the real economy and a greater probability of recession, the Fed is going to have to slow a little bit. So if that's the case, then to that extent, which is our base case scenario, you do get a soft landing. It's very possible. But the market, the equity market can't stabilize it until stabilizes until the bond market stabilizes. So you really want to see the two-year kind of hang out here for a while and not start spiking higher. Of course, we're going to get PCE data tomorrow. That should be a really important piece of information. And then the rest of it is to see if that, that, those goods, the, the inflation on the goods side, which, which is what drove yep. inflation originally, start to come down. That's the key to this. If not, the Fed's got to go hard. What do I want to own if we're starting to stabilize, Alicia? Look, I think it's too early to leg into tech, to be frank. I think that the waterfall declines we've seen are, are tr troubling. Technically, they look tough here. We are overweight on health care. We are overweight utilities. We like select staples, tobacco, beverages. We're really, we're really playing the, the slow down playbook here for now, simply because we don't think those multiples are going to hold and we think the earnings have to come down. I'll tell you this, once earnings start coming down, we'd be buyers of this market. I think that's where you can turn. Mm -hmm. As you said, Guy, the, the market anticipates and as soon as those numbers come down, then you can, you're free to go back up again. But until that happens, there's going to be a reluctance to step in front of it. Uh, before we let you go, uh, Citigroup strategist had a note out that said it's time to buy the dip in stocks. And they're saying, look, if you can't stomach U.S., you can buy the dip in Europe and emerging markets. Um, would you agree with that sentiment? I would not. I mean, we are overweight U.S. compared to Europe and emerging markets. You know, the ground zero for the slowdown on the supply and the demand side is China. That the zero COVID policy won't work and it will be a struggle to come out of it and it'd be a struggle to maintain the disease level there. So we're troubled with emerging markets. Obviously, the, the commodity exporters are doing much better, so you have to play that with active management. And Europe looks like it's headed into a recession, a real stag stagflationary environment with higher energy, higher food prices, and lower activity. So I think still the U.S. is the pe best place to go from here. Now that the multiples have come down, if I were choosing, I would choose the U.S. market over overseas markets. Alicia, great to see you. Great to see you in the studio. Thanks for stopping by. So good to we be really here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Fantastic. Alicia Levine of Bank of New York Mellon Wealth Management. Thank you very much indeed. What are we going to do next? NVIDIA stock rebounding a little, despite that apparently disappointing earnings report. We're going to break it down next. This is Bloomberg. We have a powerful uh, rally underway here, particularly in tech. And part of that is NVIDIA. Shares are recovering after the largest U.S. chip maker missed revenue forecast in the second quarter. It also said the lockdowns in the war in Ukraine weighed on its sales forecast. Typically, that would be bad for a stock. With more on this is Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. And Mandeep, earlier in pre-market, we were down hard uh, for NVIDIA. Why the turnaround? I think no one is clear yet in terms of what sort of, you know, deceleration we are going to see on the gaming side. That's the point of concern. The data center side remains strong, and uh, NVIDIA said last night they have good visibility in the data center, uh, you know, chip demand. But gaming side, look, I, I think it's a toss in terms of, you know, there are some positive drivers, but then 
you see consumers pulling back and when the consumer device shipments slow down, that will hurt NVIDIA. So I don't think uh, the market is clear yet in terms of uh, what sort of deceleration we are going to see, but clearly data center was very strong. And, you know, hyperscale cloud uh, continues to be a big driver for all the semi guys. They are making all these data centers you know, for migrating the workloads. And I, I think that's going to last for at least three, four years. So we are gonna, going to see a slowdown on that front. Mandeep, how exposed, I know they're exposed to gaming and, and the chips are often interchangeable in some ways uh, between gaming and crypto. What is happening in those two separate markets right now? Yeah, so we know crypto uh, is really going through a testing period and there is a lot of volatility and there uh, has been demand destruction on the crypto side. We, uh, you can see that in the open market, the chips, the ASPs of some of the NVIDIA chips have come down. But gaming is a uh, long term. I do think, you know, a company like Facebook spending, you know, $30 billion in CapEx and a lot of that is uh, geared towards building the metaverse. That's a long-term driver on the gaming side, and it's coming from the hyperscale cloud vendors. So that's why I think that side of the demand continues to show good visibility. It's the consumer pocket where, you know, uh, yes, the Bitcoin prices and some of the cryptocurrency prices taking a nosedive will have an impact uh, on, on the chip demand as well. So, Mandy. Let's do the supply side for just another second here. Um, let's pretend that China reopens all of a sudden tomorrow and there's no more zero lockdown policy. How quickly can NVIDIA kind of take advantage of that? Like what, what, what could the potential uh, tail, um, a tail risk be? Yeah, so there is clearly some pent up demand when it comes to China specifically. I think the Russia revenue is probably lost revenue at this point of time. but. NVIDIA's whole thing is they want to bundle software with their chips. And uh, they called out automotive last night as a big potential driver. They have $11 billion in design wins. Yeah. Now, it hasn't translated into revenue. So that is where they could see some upside, but it's still, you know, uh, maybe a couple of years out. I don't think we are going to see in the next couple of quarters. Can I just bring in the, the Broadcom VMware deal into this conversation? Uh -huh. um, chips, chips generally really cyclical. The, the Broadcom deal is effectively going to make them 50 chips, 50 software. And I'm, and I'm wondering whether or not that's an indication as well as to maybe there's a re, kind of reawakening of the idea that ultimately this industry is still cyclical. I heard the, the VW boss earlier on talking about the fact that we're starting to see signs maybe of the, uh, the super tight market beginning to ease. How quickly could yeah. a cycle reassert itself here, Mandeep? No, you're right. So clearly, I think NVIDIA has that risk. But what NVIDIA has done well is layered on software on top of their GPUs and some of the newer chips. And they keep touting the fact that even though they're not charging for the software right now, they have the potential to charge, uh, you know, license fee later on. And look, they were looking to buy ARM. So that was a $40 billion deal that didn't go through. But yep. clearly, NVIDIA, with its strong balance sheet, We'll look to add on either, you know, more uh, companies on the chip side to fill the functionality gap or okay. maybe potentially software. Mandeep, great to catch up. Thank you very much indeed. Mandeep Singh of Bloomberg Intelligence. This is Bloomberg. As far as the cost uh, is, is concerned, uh, we have a kind of a perfect storm because it's not only the coffee due to climate change, then you have packaging uh, due to the general situation, yeah. and then you have energy as a consequence of the war, and then you have shipping costs as a consequence of the COVID, uh, let's say, logistic troubles. That was Ivy Cafe chairman speaking earlier with Bloomberg Television at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Well, we are an hour into trading right here in the U.S. session. A rally underway in part uh, led by the technology sector. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking some of those moves. Hey, Abigail. Hey, Alex. Yeah, lots of strength here. The S&P 500 up 1.5 percent. That Nasdaq 100 up even more, up 1.8 percent to Alex's point on tech strength. If we take a look at uh, bonds, not doing all that much, but we do have the 10-year yield in ever so slightly, so a small smooth 
move that move there. And then oil up 3.2%. Oil, of course, a risk asset traditionally. So today it seems as though investors are taking it as more of a risk on sign as opposed to an inflationary. Now, if we flip up the board, we are going to take a look at some of the other. Uh, we're going to take a look here at the idea that the volatility is coming in a little bit. What we're taking a look at here in orange is the VIX. That is, of course, stock volatility in white, the move index bond volatility. And back in March, you can see both sort of peak to some degree and then have come in, in, in. And one reason with the VIX coming down back in uh, to think that it hasn't taken out that last high, it suggests that maybe again that there could be some sort of a, a bear market rally. You can see it doesn't show quite as well here, uh, but definitely lower than the March high. So the fear, the uncertainty coming in to some degree. That means we have possibly the first up week in eight weeks for stocks. These, of course, are the weekly gains and losses for the major indexes here in, uh, in the U.S. The S&P 500, a brutal stretch of seven down weeks in a row, the longest since 2001. And now we have big, big gains. What is it reflecting? Lots of different factors. But of course, yesterday the Fed talked about flexibility later in the year, given the fact that they have been so aggressive so far and plan to be, I guess, for the beginning part of the, the year, the mid half here. And then finally, another driver for stocks being higher. And it's so interesting, Guy, because of course, last week it was all doom and gloom around retail. Take a look at this screen. Not so much. Macy's up 14.2%. They beat, they raise on special occasion uh, dresses, but also Bloomingdale's and Blue Mercury. That's very consistent with Nordstrom. They own those brands higher end. So the high end retail consumer really still pretty strong. William Sonoma, also a nice quarter up 11.1. And then put this together, Guy, if we take a look at the discount retailers, Do Dollar General and Dollar Tree, both of these companies, their stocks clearly soaring. And all all these stocks had been down last week in uh, sympathy with retail, so you see a nice bounce back. But net sales for both of those discount retailers up mid single digits. So a very different picture than what we saw. And it seems as though some of these retailers do know how to manage inflation. So more information needed, but today definitely a bit of a risk on feel. They're definitely getting better at managing inventory, that's for certain. Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Interesting, we're also, of course, going into a long weekend in the United States. Memorial Day, we've got the end of the month, so I just I, maybe there's a little bit of positioning today as well uh, into both those, those two events. But the retail story is definitely front and centre today. Uh, and as Abigail was saying, a fairly positive one at the upper end uh, of the income bracket. Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde uh, just had a phone interview with Macy's CEO, Jeff Gannett. He told her the consumer is healthy and they have more active customers compared to a year ago. Let's talk more about Macy's. Stephanie Wissig, Jeffrey's senior analyst, joining us now. She has a buy rating on the stock, $40 price tag. Um, let's talk a little bit about this set of numbers. They were good. This is clearly a company that is enjoying the post-pandemic bounce. How sustainable is it? What are we getting in these numbers that tell us the answer to that question? Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So I think this is a really important diagnostic event for Macy's, not only for the consumer, but also for their business portfolio and then for some of their strategic actions. So the portfolio from a performance perspective, as you mentioned, Bloomingdale's was really the shining star at 28%. The overall business up about 13% on a comp basis. That was just a little bit below consensus, but I think, again, the composition indicating that that upper end consumer is holding very, very strongly. The other thing I think they need and deserve credit for is that they have done an exceptional job of putting stronger processes and controls into this business. And so the, the inventory is very much in check. This is not the case that we saw last week, which I think created a lot of consternation in the market. Mm -hmm. For Macy's, the inventory was up about 17%. Their sales up about 14 So it's moving really, really closely. They do have some pockets. They did admit to some of the COVID benefiting categories. They're going to see some markdowns in the second quarter. But the counterpoint to that is occasion-based, back-to-work-based right. apparel working really well for them. So, yeah. Stephanie, nice it does feel like the, the narrative is that it's still the reopening trade, right? Like Target, Walmart, we're totally COVID beneficiaries, and then now it's about reopening. How long can a reopening last? Like, you're only going to buy X amount of work clothes. You're only going to go get buy X amount of wedding dresses. Yeah, I think it's a fair question. It was one of the things that we wanted to unpack a little bit more with them in terms of the durability of some of these drivers. Weddings tend to be a summer season affair. And so if that's what's driving some of the occasion-based wear, that's going to fade out as we get into the back half. But I think going back to their ability to manage and to inventory control, 
it means that the risk profile for the back to school in the holiday season is just not going to be as extreme. So from a, a performance perspective across the PNL, yes, sales may slow and the guidance would imply that they will as we get into the back half. But the EBITDA expansion that this company has delivered is substantially better than anyone's yep. expecting. I also think today, and I don't like to you know get into an arm wrestling match with you know the with investors on department stores, but I think these department stores as a collective are showing that they are survivors. I mean, Macy's put up one of the strongest operating margins across the entire group, 9% operating margins in the quarter. This mm -hmm. is not a business that's on the brink of bankruptcy. So I think we also have to recognize that consumers still still do shop these venues. And these companies are can, putting up their fighting dues we, to, to make sure can we, can we just, in the game. Stephanie, can we just talk about that margin story just for a moment? Yeah. These are companies that have invested in inventory management. These are companies that have invested significantly uh, in their back office. They are running their business leaner and meaner, as you say. The Dukes are up. We're getting, and I'm going to whisper this because Alex Steele isn't going to like it, we're getting fewer and fewer promotions. Is this now a new state of affairs? The consumers got very used to this kind of promotional story, discounting. Are we done with that? I, I think so. I mean, I facetiously said to the management team just a few moments ago that the Macy's one day sale is no more because mm -hmm. it was becoming every day. And so when it happens, you know that it's going to be very isolated and tactical. And so I think they are. They're weaning the consumer off of this idea that every day you go into Macy's, you're going to get a discount. But I also think they're being much more proactive about their point of view. And I think it comes together. You're making more strategic decisions around inventory, not just buying inventory to have it, but being very disciplined about what you buy, when you flow it, and how you price it, and not getting into this promotionality constantly where you actually train your consumer to only buy on discounts. So I think they're doing a good job of mm -hmm. navigating that finer point of offering value, but not creating dependency on discounts. So, uh, dirty little secret, I only buy on discounts, so I've had to now resort to <laughs> sample sales because I will not buy full price and I cannot get decent discounts anywhere anymore, to your point. Um, Let's talk about the stock for one second. Uh, how much of the move can, that we're seeing today can we attribute to the actual numbers versus, hey, these stocks got beaten up so badly after the Walmart Target earnings fiasco that they're just making up a little bit of lost ground? Yeah, I think it's, it's we're just seeing a, a bit of a recovery in sentiment. I don't know that the operating margin at almost 9% is priced into this stock. And we're still seeing these stocks trade at bizarrely low multiples, in my opinion. These are not businesses that are going to fail anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So. I do think part of it is just the the sentiment reversion, but also if we start stepping back and looking at yep. the cash flow, working capital dynamics, and the operating margin structures of these department stores, again, the surviving class, I think you are seeing real business models here that should be upvalued. Hmm. One final quick question, more of a macro question. Um, what does this tell us about, what do these numbers tell us about what is happening with the consumer? I, I saw a pickup in credit card spending. And I'm wondering if that is an indication that maybe actually the consumer is beginning to relever, or whether or not this is just a return to people just using their credit cards. They've got the cash balances to support those credit cards, and therefore we're good. Yeah, I think this is a big question for us. When you look at the economic data, it would suggest that the consumer is stable and that there is capacity to spend. But when you talk to business operators in the retail marketplace, they're conscious of the fact that the consumer is showing up feeling differently. And purchase decisions are often made out of perception, purchasing power and feeling, not balance sheets. And so very few consumers go in and check their balance sheet statement when they're shopping around the store. Instead, they're based on confidence. And so I think there's an element here of maybe the consumer is starting to show that, okay, I made it through some of that hyperinflation. Boy, I didn't like it, but I survived it. I have some intentional purchases to make. I'm going out to weddings and events and returning to the office, and so I need to update my wardrobe. So I think it's both confidence maybe starting to stabilize, composition of what they're buying, and then as we start to see some clarity around how the consumer is positioning for the back half, maybe we get through and the consumer seems okay. I still don't think we're kind of back to the glory days of the stimulus era, but I think we're seeing the consumer is not panicking. Yeah. Which is certainly better. Yeah. 
And tomorrow yeah. we get some personal and spending data. We also get UMIS sentiment. So there's going to be an, uh, another read through on the consumer there. Stephanie, thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Wonderful insight. Stephanie Wisnick, uh, Jeffrey's senior analyst. Thank you. All right, coming up, we're going to stay with the urgent, mar the margin, and also the earnings story and the demand story. Apple says it's going to start boosting pay to keep their employees happy, but they may not need to make as many phones. Maybe the demand destruction is kicking up a little. Dan Ives, Woodbush Securities senior equity research analyst, is on with us next about what it means for their bottom line. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishka Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Stephen Whiting, City Global Wealth Chief Investment Strategist, joining Bloomberg Television, 3 to 2 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm Rishika Gupta. The UK will impose a so-called windfall tax on the profits of oil and gas companies to ease the cost of living crisis for the poorest residents. The 25% levy will raise about $6.3 billion. It will pay for one-time grants of about $120 to more than 8 million low-income households. Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government is under pressure to help struggling Britons. U.S. corporate profits fell the most quarter of by the most in almost two years. The overall economy shrank in the period. According to revised data, inflation-adjusted GDP decreased at a 1.5% annualized rate. Corporate profits decreased and annualized 2.3% from the prior quarter. But last year was the most profitable year for American corporations since 1950. In China, Premier Li Keqiang warned of dire consequences. Officials don't move decisively to prevent the economy from getting worse. Li told thousands of local officials a contraction in the second quarter must be avoided. His comments were ca more candid than the official readout published by government media. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Ritika. Let's stick with China for a moment. Uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken is speaking right now on U.S.-China relations, trying to walk that fine line, saying the U.S. is determined to avoid a new Cold War with China and that they will shape strategic uh, environment policy around Beijing and that the strategy towards China is invest, align, and compete, and that they're ready to increase communication. So, guys, it's really about walking that fine line uh, between pushing China but still maintaining that, uh, that friendship. Absolutely. Um, this doesn't feel like the big kind of strategic Shift. document that we've been hoping for in some way. I think we, I guess at some point that's going to come. I, it, it's back to the Cold War. It's cannon, it's containment, it's rollback. It's all this kind of stuff. It's going to be interesting to see ultimately where Washington lands in this kind of um, reorientation when it comes to Asia. Asia, obviously pivotal when it comes to the corporate reporting season that we're watching so carefully at the moment. Ed Ludlow was saying that the news he saw first this morning uh, was on Apple, and it, it certainly cast a long shadow. Uh, Apple says it's not going to boost iPhone production as 2022 becomes more challenging for the smartphone industry. Uh, we've also seen reports that it's going to be, going to be lifting wages uh, as well, circa 10%. Dan Ives, Wedbush Securities Managing Director and Senior Equity Research Analyst, joining us now to talk about this. He's got a buy rating at a 200 price target on Apple. Dan, in order to get to 200, and we're around 140 now, do we need to see China unlock? And is China a supply problem for Apple, or is it a demand problem for Apple? I think it's both right now. I mean, zero COVID has been a dark cloud over Apple. That's the... 100% of iPhone production, about 20% of demand. But with that said, I mean, our checks in Asia, and I think even what you're seeing in this report, better than expected. It's holding up well in terms of what Apple sees on the other side of the storm. And I believe the stock is way overly discounting, you know, what I believe is going to be much better news as we go out the next six, 12 months. Nevertheless, 141. It's hard for overall tech to bottom without Apple. Do you feel that Apple has bottomed here? I get the six to 12 months out, you're constructive for sure, but right now, has it bottomed? Look, I mean, our view is NVIDIA was bottoming, and I think we saw that you know, this morning, and I believe Apple is basically bottoming. I think right now, expectations, our numbers get cut anywhere between five to 10%. I think you're baking in a hard landing. You're baking in zero, COVID basically continues for the rest of the year. 
if anything happens that's just a little better than that, which we believe, just given what we see in demand, then I believe that we basically start a bottom here in Apple. In terms of the margin story, they're raising wages. Other companies are raising, raising wages as well. That seems hard to say right now, Dan. Um, mm. Is there going to be a margin hit here? And, and given just the profitability, given the top line, is that something they can absorb relatively straightforwardly? Well, I think they're a unique company that could pass price increases to the consumer with minimal churn. I think that, that's what we'll see with iPhones coming out in terms of iPhone 14. But the biggest thing, the biggest innovation is the chips. I mean, they right now own their ecosystem. It's given them huge margin lift enabling them to do things like cost increases, raise wages, make sure they keep developers. And that's why it's that rock of Gibraltar install base. You got a billion iPhones right now. You still have a quarter of them that have not upgraded in three and a half years. That's why, in our opinion, this continues to be in these types of sell-offs and the chaos. Apple's a gold name to own here. Um, hey, Dan, there's a headline that's crossing that's Microsoft's going to slow hiring in Windows, Office, and Teams groups. We've also seen the likes of, like, Lyft and some of the high-flying tech companies uh, put a hiring freeze or wage freeze on. Um, wh what do you make of that? Wh wh is this just a tech thing? Is this going to spread to other sectors? Like, what's your take? Well, first of all, a lot of this was planned. I mean, if you look, let's say, at Microsoft, I mean, some of those areas, they basically increased by 70, 80 percent in terms of some pockets of cloud spending. So you'll just see a natural slowdown. Again, many will yell fire in a crowd theater. But if you look ultimately at Microsoft, the cloud story, we're still only a third of the way through in terms of this cloud chip. But you, these companies are starting to see some of those sort of headwinds. They're slowing higher to make sure that they do not sort of wait to the game. And I think this is good. It conserves margins, and that's something right now in terms of what the street's baking in. It goes back to expectations. Look in the video is a good example. I, mean, I believe those are signs that we've started to get to some sort of bottoming when it comes to tech. Dan, how long do we stay down for? That's, that's the, the bigger question, I think, here. These companies have revalued lower. We... We probably kind of got too far ahead of us over our skis. We've come down. We've come down pretty sharply. My question to you is, why did they go back up again? Well, I think first off, I mean, right now what's baked in, it's, it's a Rubik's Cube macro, right? From zero COVID to horrific situation in Ukraine, inflation, Fed chasing after it. You, you, if you start to get numbers in June that are what I believe as we go into earnings season, slightly better than expectations in terms of where they're feared. Sell side brings down numbers, which has happened across the board. Street goes to 2023, and it just comes down to, if we have a mild recession, then tech stocks rip from these levels. Mm -hmm. I believe you are baking in just Armageddon-like expectations into some of these names. That's why when you have names like NVIDIA that have strong earnings, lower guidance, and you start to see the stock trade up. In my experience, 20 plus years covering these tech stocks through recession, that's where we start to get to some sort of bombing process. Mm -hmm. You're basing around that bottom. Hey, Dan, before we let you go, I just want to end on Twitter. Uh, so apparently uh, Elon Musk is dropping plans to partially fund his purchase of Twitter with a margin loan. And I just wanted to understand what you understand from that. Does it mean he's going to walk away? Does it mean he feels super confident he can get a lower price? Uh, what was your takeaway from that? I think a slight percentage chance increase now goes up that he will do the Twitter deal, but it's still 50-50 in terms of the odds. And I believe 54-20, there's a better chance of me playing for Golden State Warriors in the playoff than that happening. So it's about, <laughs> is it a lower price point or does he walk away for the billion and ultimately fight Twitter board and court? That's why the stock's trading at 39. Street's basically saying it's either a lower bid or he ultimately tries to walk away. A slight positive for Twitter, but there's going to be many twists and turns ahead in this circus show. Yeah, indeed. All right, Dan, thanks a lot. Appreciate the insight today. A good day to have you on. Dan Ives, Wedbush Securities Managing Director and Senior Equity Research Analyst. Thanks very much. This is Bloomberg.
So we're around 30 minutes away from the European close. Remember, we are coming into a long weekend in the States. We're coming into the end of the month. Just factor that into your thinking right now. Stocks accelerated up by eight tenths of one percent. Retail is doing well. That could be down to the windfall tax story here in the UK. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But also, the luxury stocks are having a very good day today. That feels like it's a read across from the Macy's story. Uh, we're talking Bloomingdale's here. We're talking high-end luxury. That feels like a logical line to draw. The euro trading with the 107 handle. 107.09, we're up by around three-tenths of 1%. The cable rate, though, is nudging a little lower. We're, we're basically flat on the day. Big day out of the UK. Uh, we've had the announcement of a windfall tax on energy companies. Uh, we've had from the Chancellor additional help coming through from the most stressed in society as a result of the cost of living squeeze. Uh, all of that coming together today uh, in the, uh, the European market. You can see it in the pound. You can see it in the FTSE 100. You can see it in the 250 as well. You can see it in the yield story right now. Uh, the question is, is this going to be a short-term benefit for the UK? and a long-term negative for the UK in terms of the in investment narrative. Christian Malek is going to be joining us. He is the head of EMEA Oil & Gas Research, front and centre in this story. Uh, he is going to join us next from JP Morgan to give us his sense of what impact this is going to have, A, on those sectors, but B, on the long-term investment case around the UK. Seema Shah is going to join us on the same question. This is Bloomberg.